So Benita Lawrence is Mi'kmaq, and she teaches Native Studies at York. Uh, this is her second book. Her first book <coughs> is called Real Indians and Others. It's a wonderful book. It has taught me a lot. And it's about uh, urban Native identity. She has also been a traditional singer with groups in Toronto and Kingston. So please join me in welcoming Benita. Congrats, everybody. Um, I've never been so honored both to have the AIM song sung for an opening and also to, um, to be allowed to hold the eagle feather, which is really an honor. Um, I wrote down some things and then feel like, oh. <laughs> um, I mean, the book came out of, um, uh, I guess, being non-status Mi'kmaq myself, uh, I, I first became interested because I learned that there were many, many Algonquins who didn't have Indian status, and yet I discovered the big difference was that they were on the land. Anyway, um, so then came 10 years of, <laughs> of working on it. This is my first summer where I haven't been working on the book. Um, so anyway, I wanted to thank everybody for coming. Thank Min Washin uh, for hosting us and Ipso for arranging it and the speakers for agreeing to speak. Um, I, I guess I was going to say a few things. Um, I thought it was, I'm really happy that Ipso asked me to have the um, uh, book launch here uh, because, I mean, it's the first book launch for Fractured Homeland and it's in Ottawa. And I mean, the city is the national capital region for Canada, and in 20 years of negotiating a land claim, the fact that Ottawa is on Algonquin land has never been raised. And to me, that says everything about you ever need to know about the politics of a comprehensive claim process in Canada, <laughs> you know, the power relations involved. Um, but it's central in other ways, too. I think it was one of the first places where clear-cutting of Algonquin land started back in, the, in the, around 1800. Uh, but also, I think the most important thing is that it really um, is at the heart of the colonial boundaries and is on the Ottawa River, which the British turned into uh, a site of division for Algonquin people. Um, I talk with my hands, and now I'm talking with an eagle feather, and I'm not even sure if that's what I should be doing. But that's... Um, um, so, I mean, it's really, I'm really happy that we have somebody here from Quebec because I've, I've missed that about, I was only allowed to do research in Ontario because it was a funded research book and they were very clear that unless you get permissions from certain people and I was denied permission to do interviews in Quebec. So for that reason, it's limited to Ontario and it's really, it's less than half the story in a sense, you know, if you want to st talk about strictly territorial-wise. But it is about Ontario Algonquins. Um, some Algonquins, from, from talking to them, some Algonquins believe that the division into Quebec and Ontario happened so long ago that we just have to live with it, and that's, that's, that's that. A lot of Algonquins that I interviewed talked about the fact that until there was a spiritual reunification uh, between Quebec and Ontario Algonquins, no kinds of negotiations should be happening with Canada. And a lot of people very firmly believe that uh, any negotiations with Canada are taking place in what they call the politics of recognition, which is to say that uh, Canada needs comprehensive claim processes in order to domesticate Native people, in order to uh, surrender, get them to surrender their remaining territories in return for an inferior, inferiorized relationship with Canada. And from that perspective, the land claim is one of the worst things that could be happening. But the book isn't about the land claim. However, the land claim intruded into almost every aspect of talking with Algonquins about identity. So I thought I'd just mention that. Uh, but the speakers tonight will all be speaking from the heart about these issues. So, uh, you know, they're the experts about all what's happening to Algonquins today. The book took 10 years to produce. It wouldn't have taken me so long hadn't, had it not been happening for such a, a crucial time for Algonquins in Ontario. Um, and although I'm non-status Mi'kmaq Wisque, or Onluwisque as how Mi'kmaq people would put it, um, and I know something about being non-status, um, the way uh, my family was divested of its lands two generations ago, so I know nothing about what it means to live on my own territory. 
and uh, to have to struggle to protect it the way Algonquins have had to. Uh, and though I now live in Algonquin territory, uh, and therefore, like many uh, non-native settlers, the land claim, if it proceeds, will affect me, uh, it's nothing like the issues that are facing Algonquin people themselves. Um, and it took me 10 years to write the book because it's taken me that long to respect the difficulties that Algonquins face in, in dealing with all of these issues. And to speak as an outsider from the heart, um, to, uh, to, you know, to, to know what I believed and to address it as, as best as I could. And, um, and also to know how to write a book without stirring things up further, without making things harder, right, for Algonquin people than they already are. Um, and, you know, so I'm just going to say that to introduce it. And, you know, Algonquin people are going to be evaluating the book for its own, on its own basis. And I want to introduce the three people. Um, Bob Majori is going to be speaking first. And he's a member of the Ottawa Algonquins, um, Ottawa Algonquin community. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's been involved since about 1998. And he's been involved most recently with the Algonquins of Ontario Review Committee, where uh, the... Um, um, the memberships of individuals are, are being protested, which is happening to increasing numbers of Algonquins these days. So Bob will be speaking at first. Uh, and second, Verna McGregor will be speaking. And Verna is from Kitigan Zibi. Uh, she's an Anishinaabekwe from Kitigan Zibi. Uh, she's part of the Grandmother Circle on the hunting uh, and fishing uh, case uh, that uh, has been going on now for 10 years. Um, um, that Michael Swinwood is fighting. And those who are interested can check uh, World Wide Web, uh, www.7algonquinhunters.org. Um, so Verna will be speaking next. Uh, and finally, Bob Lovelace will be speaking. And um, you know, I, I'm not sure what to say about Bob, because there's so much I could say. I mean, because I've known Bob for probably the longest of any of the, uh, well, I met Bob when I first met to went to Queens and was at sweat lodges at his place for a good many years. So um, Bob has been, uh, has been involved in Algonquin struggles since uh, the days of the Rice War, uh, which started in 1979, um, and has been involved with, with struggles that Ardoch Algonquin First Nations have been involved with for many years, including court cases uh, for the Algonquin right to hunt um, for non-status Algonquins. Um, most recently in the uranium struggle that many people know because Bob uh, insisted on, on observing Algonquin jurisdiction and therefore went to prison for it for about six months. Um, most recently, um, uh, Bob has been involved with uh, international indigenous struggles, both with Palestinians and um, with uh, struggles for, against climate uh, change uh, with uh, Bolivians, and he's going to be speaking about uh, what does it mean to be an indigenous <coughs> person today and in the future, I mean, whatever he wants to speak, but all of you will be speaking about the issues that, as you see it, is important. Uh, so I, I, um, I guess I'll start by, the, those are the introductions for everybody, so Bob's going to speak first, and uh, Jimmy Gletch. <laughs> Thank you, Benita. Um, I'm definitely not an academic or a public speaker, so bear with me, please. I, I made a few notes, and I, I do thank you for inviting me to speak on this. I have been around the land claim process for quite a number of years, and uh, I am pretty familiar with how it has all worked, but I found reading Bonita's book very enlightening because it, it really explained and answered a lot of the questions that I had been asking for a long time. So, if you bear with me, I'm going to read these notes as well as I can. <coughs> May I sit down to do this? Thank you. <laughs> my, my eyes aren't that good. <laughs> okay. How the Algonquin land claim has affected the non-status Algonquin people? The Pequawknagan Chief and Council, seven and all, sit as Algonquin Negotiation Representatives, or ANRs, at the land claim negotiation table. Each non-status Algonquin community is represented by one ANR at the negotiation table. 
There were some established non-status Algonquin communities prior to the Algonquins of Ontario land claim, such as Ardoch. But some such as Ottawa were organized because of the land claim. There had been an Algonquin presence in Ottawa and surrounding area prior to the settling of the land by Europeans, but any formally organized community was long gone, even though many Algonquin people still inhabited the area. The Ottawa Algonquin community is still not an active functioning community, although there are a considerable number of people who identify with it. I'm sure there will be a great sense of a greater sense of community in time. The Indian Act was enacted in 1876 by Canada under provisions of Section 32 of the Constitution Act, 1867. This is when Indians in Algonquin Territory were registered with the Government of Canada and became what we now know as status Indians. For example, if an Indian was away on his trap line when the Indian agent visited the community, he did not get registered. In many cases, if he did not wish to go to a reserve, he or she was not registered. If an Indian was registered and went to the reserve, he or she was under control of the Indian agent. And there was always the threat of having the children taken away for many reasons. The threat of taking the children was used to control the Indians. The Indians that did not get registered were on their own with no government assistance and discrimination made it hard for them to get work to make enough money to feed their families. That is why so many Native people were afraid to identify as Indians and many identified as Scottish, Irish, and French, etc. But few non-Native people were fooled and the non-status Algonquins continued to suffer just in different ways from the reserve Algonquins. There are non-status people who can prove that they descend from people who identified as Indian in Algonquin territory prior to the enactment of the Indian Act in 1876, the same as the people who were registered as Algonquin, but they are being required to prove that they're ancestors were not only Indian, but Algonquin, when that was not required in 1876. There were boards set up prior to 2001 that decided if people qualified to be accepted as non-status Algonquins, and if they were accepted, their names were posted at the Pigwakanagan Reserve for 90 days. If no one appealed or protested their acceptance, within the 90-day period, they were enrolled to be consulted in the land claim process. As the, as the agreement in principle, AIP, came close to being voted on, all Algonquins were required to re-enroll as voters for the AIP. This time, all the non-status Algonquins had to have their names posted for 30 days, during which time anyone on the voters list could protest their acceptance again. Most of, if not all, of those who have been accepted by a board prior to 2001 were protested by status members of Pickwagnagon, most of whom are members of the Pickwagnagon Council. There was a great deal of suffering by the Reserve Algonquins with residential schools, etc., and I understand why they feel the way they do, but many of the non-status Algonquins suffered as well. They got little or no education, as was the case in my, uh, uh, my ancestors. They had to stay home to work to get enough food to eat. My mother, who was born in 1920, went to school for four years and went to work when she was 14 on a farm and sawmill where there was a large number of people to cook, bake, clean, and do laundry for. She had to get up at 3 or 4 a.m. to work on the bread baking. She told me the story of having to wash clothes <coughs> on a washboard while having 12 boils on her stomach. For all this work, she was paid $4 per month. But it was usually paid off with used clothing. <laughs> Mother's at a nursing home now. Unfortunately, 
now we are being protested along with other non-status Algonquins under rules approved by the government of Canada and Ontario and the Algonquins of Ontario. There's no question that we descend from Indians living in Algonquin territory prior to 1876. But proving that they were Algonquin may be a problem. The fact that the government of Canada makes Indians is proven by the fact that non-native wives and ex-wives of Pequawknagot members prior to 1985 cannot be removed from the voters list according to the law as written in the AIP, which is still to be ratified for the people. The fact that a law can be written with no mechanism for a sober second thought and acted upon, I find problematic. I accept the fact that non-native people should not participate in the negotiation process as Algonquins, and I mean all non-native people, but those that can prove that they meet the criteria that ancestors of registered members of Pictuaknagon were required to meet should not be denied, denied that right. Any non-status Algonquin who is enrolled as a voter <coughs> for the agreement and principle, AIP, will have to re-enroll to become a beneficiary to the land claim, and once again, they will be threatened with exclusion. This is my personal view of who non-status people are and how they are affected by the Algonquins of Ontario land claim, and I accept the fact that there are going to be different points of view. Are there any questions? And I love questions because I'm a lot better at that than I, than I am at reading this. <laughs> First, I've got to do this. so I'm going to get everybody to work tonight. No. <laughs> no, um, Benita asked me at the last minute, uh, about 20 minutes ago, if I would come and sit and speak for a few uh, few hours. No, no. <laughs> so I said, sure. <laughs> no, um, I'm from Kitagon Zibi, and for those of you who don't know where Kitagon Zibi is, it's just about an hour and a half north here, of here. Uh, I'm a Gongwen Nishnal Berkeley. And I've been sitting for the past 10 years, as Bonita mentioned, with the circle of grandmothers and thinking a lot because what got, us, got me into all this too as well is also with, I've been sitting with our elder William Kamanda for a number of years. And uh, I could see the animosity too as well uh, I grew up on a reserve, then coming out, and we grew up also to as well with racism. It was very shameful to be native, as one of the Bobs mentioned to even his ancestors. And then uh, for those coming off on reserve, it was almost like, and it's still the same, like it's almost like we're targeted all the time. But what I was telling Bonita too as well is also it was a clash of understanding with the coming of the newcomers and a native understanding of we lived in prosperity and we lived in freedom. So it was very devastating to be corralled really on the reserve system. And again too as well, it was so... Um, devastating because we as Algonquin, and this is what my grandparents and my parents would tell me too as well, is we were nomadic. 
And the reason why we were nomadic to semi-nomadic is also is that you live with the land and so that why we would move from our hunting grounds as well is that you do not over harvest the resource because if you stay in one area then you deplete the fish you deplete the resource we also had a clan system which was totally was the the, the will to erase that too as well and that was tied to the water systems. So again, too, as well, we had our own source of land management. And each family or each clan was also would know their land, their water system. And they would also invite another clan to come in. So if you were the fish clan, you wouldn't be eating the fish. And so then you would switch territories. So we had this concept of freedom and an abundance. Then to be brought in in this concept of land ownership was very kind of foreign. And to even be uh, corralled into a reserve system was even more devastating because if you have that understanding, because what they would say is also too, and they still say that even now, it's just from reserve, on Dewindjabayan, where do you come from? Meaning where, what part of the land you come from. Even like Pequokinagog, it's very descriptive. It, it describes the landscape. Kitagong Zibi means garden river, and that's where it was very fertile between the river. Gatno here, Tanaga Gatno, means between two rivers the land is fertile. So that's where the, the language was also tied to the land. So again, it was very <coughs> devastating, even this whole residential school system because it was the need to erase our language and the disconnection to our lands. Even I was talking with, meeting with a number of years ago, a couple of years ago, even going to do a, a talk at Bon Echo Park, which is a provincial park, and you have to pay to get in, but they have our, the rock paintings there, and they have the, and I said, it's a special site. You, there was our sacred sites, where we go and do ceremony. And uh, I went there last year <coughs> with Elder Peter DeConti, who's our fire keeper. And one of the things he said, first of all, when I got there, I thought my job was done. He's here and he met with the archeologist. So I thought my job was done. I just got him to the site. When he got there, he, I said, why are you telling me all this thing in Indian before? And he goes, when he gets here, he goes, I don't want to be on camera. <laughs> so I said, so he goes, you're going to go talk on camera. <laughs> so, so, but one of the things he wanted to relay, though, to as well as even, and it goes back to this connection to the land. All our land is, all Mother Earth, as William would say, is sacred. And we as humans, because we're blessed with language and reason, we have a responsibility to look after all of creation but again too as well we've come out of balance and we see that but what he was saying last year is also too as well is the earth is, is sacred like our our territories our traditional lands were very sacred and there were places that were extra special such as Bon Echo or this Wazo Rock because they were also tied to the meridian points but he said, so they were like, nature was our church. And he said what he was saying is, we've respected the newcomers' places of worship. And here we are today, he says, where um, our places of worship haven't been respected. So it's that reconnection back to the land. And how does that tie to the comprehensive a claim again, it's a colonial system. My mom would always say, it's our land. Why do we have to prove that it's our land? And again, too, as well, the other part is, I always like with uh, William's message, too, as well, he would always say, meaning all my relatives, because really we're all related. And, and that's the teaching even with the medicine wheel. You see the four colors is and that represents 
the Earth's people, the four races, the four colors, because they said, although we have different, we are different colors on the outside, what binds us together is that we are all children of the Earth, so we also have a responsibility. So again, and that's what brings back this whole um, turmoil now today in terms of who owns the land and what is this comprehensive claim and who's Indian, who's not Indian. And I'm thinking, well, what is being an Anishinaabe? And again, too, as well, um, it, it's a difficult, it creates a lot of conflict and it's, a, it's a, also a colonial system. The other part with the treaty is, I was saying that the other day, is saying, if Canada has such a bad history in terms of adhering to treaties, why are we in treaty in two Because the reality is, <laughs> it's not a level playing field. And, and so, I think that's, we as humans, we're, um, it's always connecting back to when it's stepping on a bit further and saying we're also humans, but we also have a responsibility. And even with this, it always ties to this consumption in the capitalistic system. But then again, too, as well as how do we walk in balance, even even with this claim. And, and um, there are other countries, as Bob would know, who go to war over what, and at the same time, they're damaging the earth as a result of conflict and the children. And our basic teaching is we're here for the children, so what are we leaving behind? So on that note, I just say, miigwech mm kakina. -hmm. My name is Robert Lovelace, and I'm really honored to be here. I'm honored to be here with uh, Bernard and Bob and, uh, and all of you, and particularly with Benita, because I've had the opportunity to read her book, and um, it really is an honor to, uh, to be here, uh, to have been invited to come and speak. I'm a uh, I'm Algonquin, but I'm also Tulagi, Cherokee. Uh, I began my life uh, from my mother's womb, and my mother was a Cherokee. Um, in my in my youth, I was involved in some political struggles, and uh, came to Canada for refuge, and wound up in the Ardoc community. And one day, Harold Perry came by and said, would you, would you help me? Uh, because the government is going to take our wild rice away. And uh, I had got to know some of the other Indian people because in, in those days, that's what we called each other, Indians. Um, we didn't refer to necessarily to ourselves as Algonquins or or Mohawks or Saudi. Um, we were all Indians. And uh, so I got in his truck and uh, we started a lifelong friendship and a lifelong journey in protecting the land. And along the way, um, after asking me about, well, about a dozen times whether I would consider being adopted, I finally consented because I felt that uh, it was uh, it was disrespectful to deny uh, that request uh, again uh, because it was made in, in the most since most sincere way. Um, I I'm telling you that because I want you to know that where I where my position is in terms of the land claim. I'm not a beneficiary. I'm not a voter. Uh, I've spent most of my adult life working with, within the framework of that land claim within the Ardoc community as a servant. Because one of the things that I learned as a young boy uh, from my mother was that if we were ever captured or we ever found ourselves in another community, um, 
we should behave ourselves and act as servants. And that's the relationship that, uh, that I've, I've tried to, uh, to maintain as an Algonquin. Uh, service to the Family Heads Council and service to the elder uh, Harold Perry, who's been my uh, really lifelong friend now. So that's where I position myself. Now, Bonita says in the acknowledgments in the, in the book that this book would not have come into existence without my help. Um, and that's the only thing in the book that she's wrong about. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is this book needed to be written. Um, this is really a phenomenal book with a lot of universal appeal. Someone in Peru can pick this book up and understand what's going on in their community by looking at this book and reading what's happened in our communities. And that's why it's so powerful. That's why it's so, so important. And that's why it's come into being. It's also come into being because our situation needed re a researcher. It needed somebody who could spend 10 years uh, talking to people, looking at what was going on, doing some analysis, uh, comparing it to sort of the theoretical stages of, of, uh, of social dysfunction. All of that stuff that, uh, that you'll, you'll read between the lines and in the lines of this book. Um, pretty phenomenal. And that's also why it came into being, because it had somebody like Benita, who was an excellent researcher and a really excellent writer, because she writes in a way that you and I can understand it. Um, and that, as I said, if somebody in, in Guatemala or Peru picks this book up, they will be able to read it and understand what's going on. Um, so that's why it came into being. Um, I'm not going to get political. Um, I could because RDOC has taken very strong stands um, for a number of years against the present land claim and acted independently. Um, but I'm not necessarily going to labor that. What I do want to talk about is the fact that uh, the fractures in the Algonquin community go back a very long way. They didn't start with the land claim. And so we really can't necessarily blame the land claim, but we can we can certainly see from Benita's book uh, how it played a significant role in continuing to fracture our community. Um, what I liked about, one of the things I liked about the book um, is that when, as I read it, it reminded me of many of the things that Ardock has done in terms of developing successful relationships with our, with our community, with the people, uh, with the settlers that live among us, because we do live in a settler uh, colony. Um, that's the way uh, I think I look at it, is this Canada is a settler colony. Not, it, it's also an economic colony and an imperial colony, but for the most part, you and I experience the colony in terms of its settlers. They're our neighbors, by the way. And so, uh, Ardoch has striven in many ways to try to find some reconciliation with the people who we, uh, we rub shoulders with on a regular basis. Uh, and often that's been to our credit and it's also been to our advantage because when we've had to stand up against the government, when we've had to, to fight standoffs, uh, when recently a couple of four or five years ago when we were fighting uh, to protect our land from uranium mining, uh, settlers were coming and giving us gas, they were giving us money, they were handing food across the fence, um, and so that settler, settler colonialism began to dissolve a bit for all of us. Um, and, I, and I think that's to Ardoch's credit in, in large measure. Um, I did want to mention one thing that, uh, uh, that I, I thought about when I was coming up this, this, this afternoon to Ottawa is that uh, Harold and I attended the first meeting in which non-status Indians were called to pick Wapnagon. And then it was the, uh, uh, the Golden Lake, uh, Algonquins of Golden Lake First Nation. And uh, Kirby White Duck, who was then not the chief, but he was the person who was assigned to community development in the, uh, in the land claim. And so he, his job was to gather all the non-status Indians, um, the, the dozen or so that he thought was, were out there. 
And uh, he, 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 he called Harold and uh, people from Bravo Valley from, uh, from Whitney and uh, people from um, Baptiste Blake from, uh, and also from, uh, from Bancroft um, and a couple of people from, from Pembroke. And we sat around and uh, he basically explained to everybody that if they, um, you know, stood behind band council when pictures were being taken, that was the position that uh, was best suited to them. Uh, that wasn't good enough for the non-status people that were there. They said, what we want is we want all decisions to be made by consensus because that's the traditional way that Algonquins make decisions. They said we would like mutual recognition of each community because we are a community. We've been a community and our historical records and our, our family stories tell us that we've had an unbroken uh, relationship since time immemorial in, this, in the territory in which we live. Um, so we want mutual recognition of these, these communities. And we also want a share, an equal share for each community in terms of the community education and community development dollars that come through the, the land claim so as it progresses. Uh, and then we were ushered into the, uh, the band council chambers and uh, they shook everybody's hand and we went home. And as things progressed, um, they didn't progress for the non-status Indians at that point. Uh, and I'm going to leave it up to you to read Benita's book because I'm going to leave you there with that part of the story. So you're going to have to read her book to find out what happens after that. Okay? Now, um, as I said, this, this, hasn't, this story of fracturing the land uh, really began a long, long time ago. And I wanted to mention a couple of things that, that whenever we get a group together, it's really good to, to do some, some community education. Um, the, um, one of the things that comes to my mind is that here in, in Ottawa, a lot of things have taken place. Uh, Philemon Wright came here in 1800, 200 years ago. 200 years ago, where, we're, where we are on Catherine Street, was part of an old growth forest. If we would have walked up to the Bluff Hill, where Parliament buildings are, uh, that would have been sort of a, a, a viewpoint that we could look over and see the Gatineau River. We could see downriver a bit where the Rideau flushes out into the uh, into the Kijazee to the Ottawa. And uh, so, and, and across the, the way, it was completely old growth forest. Uh, except where there had been some forest fires and some um, deciduous trees, maples and oaks and things like that had grown up in some of the, some of the forests. And uh, in 1800, if you looked across the river, you would have seen uh, people make maple sugaring in the winter, uh, at the end of the winter, <coughs> in the spring. And that's when Philemon Wright came. And Philemon Wright started cutting the maple trees where the people were, were sugaring. And they protested. They said, what are you cutting our sugar trees for? He said, well, I, I've been given permission uh, by, uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the government to come and cut these trees and build a mill. And when I build this mill, it's going to help everybody because we're going to create jobs. You've heard that before, right? <laughs> we're going to create jobs. We're going to establish farms so that people won't have to worry about hunting and fishing anymore, that they can, they can eat you know, grain and stuff that we can you know, sell. So we're going to provide food security. And you're all going to share it. You know, that's what Philemon Wright said. You know what the, the, the people said? They said, um, gosh, um, we know about you. you. You come from the east, and uh, we've seen what happens in the east. You're going to hunt our, our beaver. You're going to you're going to kill the wolves. You're going to you're going to shoot the the, the hawks. Uh, you're going to kill the bear and the deer. And uh, pretty soon, we're going to starve. And Philemon Wright said, "Yeah, you're probably right about that, but don't worry about that because progress is on its way." <laughs> anyway, um, Philemon Wright said, "What I'll do is this." He said, "I'll go back to." Uh, 
Montreal or, or Quebec City, I'll talk to Sir William Johnson and I'll make sure that everything is okay. Well, he does that. He had to go anyway, but he comes back and he gathers everybody together and he says, well, I went and talked to Sir William Johnson and guess what? He said that I have the right to be here and you're to treat me well and if you don't treat me well, he's going to cut out your presence, which you get at Gunnasatagi in the, in the, in the <coughs> summer. So, um, what happened is uh, people said, well, if that's what Sir William Johnson said, I guess, I guess that's so. Now, this is an interesting point. Why did they believe this guy? Because they were Anishinaabe. Because they were of an oral tradition. And when somebody lied, it might cost them their life. And so they believed him because people spoke the truth. In fact, 20 years later, when Philemon Wright wrote about this in Upper Canada, in the for the legislature of Upper Canada, <coughs> the report, he concluded that report with, and we have lived in peace at peace ever since. Um, and they have treated, and those people have treated us well. In fact, I've never met a people who so regarded justice and equity as the Algonquins on the Ottawa River. That's an interesting piece of history. What happened after that, though, Phil and Wright started that mill here in Ottawa. And within 40 years, really 35 years, the trees were stripped all the way to Perth. The forests were cut all the way to Perth. By, by 1850, they were cut all the way to the headwaters of the Mississippi, almost the Madawaska, and the Rio, within a matter of, of really two or three generations. That's also an important piece of history. Now, one last thing I wanted to, to sort of uh, talk about in terms of, of history and fracturing that land is this, is that uh, we, met Europeans about 400 and some years ago, and we engaged with them in the beaver trade. And at first it created this spike in our economy. It created a spike in our affluence. We were able to take the beaver, which was our, our friend, our, our, you know, an animal that had provided uh, clothing and, and food for us. And we were able to exchange that beaver uh, for really interesting goods like cloth, needles and thread, because those were the those were the primary things that were traded. For kettles and pots, and knives and axes, and things like that. But it also cost us a lot. Because our neighbors to the south, who we had been usually friendly with and entered into trade uh, on Lake Champlain, uh, they lived in a valley where they could grow corn. And they often supplied us with corn when, when times got tough and we could trade with them. Um, but they didn't have any beavers. What they had, they trapped out in about 10 years. And after that, the only way that they could trade with those who had the cloth and the needles and the pots and pans and the knives and axes were to go and take beaver pelts from other people. Their advantage was that they could travel on corn the same way that Caesar's armies could travel on oats and, and rye. And so they were able to raid all the way into the James Bay. They were able to raid all the way up the Ottawa River to Lake Nipissing for those beaver pelts so that they could trade them for European goods. The land was, at that point, fractured again, and the people were fractured. That was in the very, very beginning. So that fracturing begins way back. And one of the major causes for the fracturing is the capitalist economy, the mercantile economy, which became the capitalist economy. And, uh, and our own desire for things better than what we had. So I guess what I wanted to end with today is, is just to let you know, buy this book, because it really tells an important story. It's a really important piece in this whole story. And it's so well researched that it's going to help you put this together. 
And there's no greater, and, and what's nice about this book for, for me is I can read about my community and I can celebrate a lot of the things that we've done right because Algonquins have done a lot of things that are right in this world. Uh, we have a language that will better interpret the ecology of the Ottawa Valley better than any other language in the world. Algonquins have gone nowhere else in the world and imposed their way of life, their religion, their ideologies, the way they think on any other people in the world, but they've kept it to themselves and they, they've used it, they've tried to share it with, with newcomers in a good way. The same way they did with, uh, tried with Phil and Wright. And so that's, that's important. There's no greater time in our lives or in the lives of humanity right now with global warming, the looming economic catastrophe that global warming is going to bring apart upon us. Uh, there's no greater time in the history of humanity that we need community. We need to find some peace. And uh, I think that's what, uh, and, and, and what we need to do, and why the title of Benita's book and what she's talking about is so important, is that we'll never bring people together unless we can bring the land back together. I'm just going to give you one really sh visual picture of that. Picture in your mind the United States with all the states, and then Canada with the ten provinces and the, and the territories. They're all blocked out in squares and rectangles. They don't fit anything that's re real. They don't fit any of the, the real environments that we live in. And because of that, they have no future. Because the reality is that we depend upon the replenishment cycles of this earth for our food, for our shelter, uh, for our water, for our clean air. And unless we can put the land back together in terms of its ecology, we'll never get the people back together. But it's a dual process. It's getting ourselves back together, it's re-indigenizing ourselves, and getting ourselves back together. What Benita talks in her book about is she helps us understand you know, what goes wrong and how some communities, and not just Arda, but other communities, including Pickwalk or not, have made efforts to try to do that. Um, there's no good guys and bad guys, by the way, in the book. So uh, don't worry about that. Uh, we need to re-indigenize ourselves. So thank you very much for inviting me to blabber on and on about the things that I've done. But questions, comments, I think we have lots of time. What time is it anyway? 7 oh, Yeah, please, everybody is here. Speak to them. <laughs> Maybe they want to ask you questions. Me too. Yeah, you can ask me questions too. But yeah, so please, uh, comments and, and thoughts about it, you know. It takes a while to digest from everybody's visions, so. <laughs> Yeah. We had, um, I had guests over three weeks ago, Pijou and Peter, Peter Harrison from, uh, he's from England, and they were up in uh, Barrier Lake, because uh, we had a little, um, there was a protest going on again with the forestry, and again it, it's the clear cutting. Uh, and this, I like the story about the maple syrup too, because we have one cookum there. She, uh, a, a few years ago, we went. She was protesting too, because the Bowwater wanted to cut her maple stand, and she had a traditional uh, maple syrup. And for us, we're saying, of all the acreage you have, why did you choose her stand? So anyway, what happens is that she got hauled in the court. Here's an 80-year-old woman in a wheelchair hauled in the court. And she has no money. And they have no money. And it's like for the legal system, so I always wonder what's justice to. Anyway, going back to Pijou and Peter. So I come home Friday and here they are, because I told them the week before you could come and come to my place. I live in Kittagong, ZB. And so they arrived there. But anyway, I was asking Peter from the UK. I said, what brings you here? Like, you're up in the bush with 
please, <laughs> from the UK. And he goes, well, I had a choice to go to Syria. I said, oh, no, <laughs> please, <laughs> Or also the Aboriginal justice. And I said, oh, yeah, so that's interesting. But then I was saying, so what type of, during our further conversation, so what type of animals do you have in the UK? He goes, to be honest with you, we have very little left. He goes, we used to have bears, we used to have wolves, we don't have that anymore. And he says, we have some deer. And so, and then that really hit me because I'm thinking, oh my goodness. And everything is so, um, it is so planned and controlled. And it's man's need for control. And again, too, I said that could easily happen here. Because a month before that, I had this other visitor from France. And I asked him the same question. I said, so what animals do you have? Like, do you go hunt? Uh, and he says, a little bit, but we have wild boar. And that's like, a, it's, it's, it's not an indigenous species. And then I was thinking, oh my god, when I was working in the band office, 12 years ago, we had this group from the Czech Republic, and I found it so weird. They're coming to our community because they want to be taken in the bush because they want to look at the bush and the understory because they said all their forests are managed and they don't have, they've lost a lot of the indigenous plants. So I said, so what's happening here, what's happened in their countries could easily happen here. And I think that's why what Bob mentioned is also it's like almost raising an awareness. And, and the media, we're good targets in the media, but it's that understanding as to, I said, there's a reason why we were called, like in Quebec now, in the Quebec we were called Les Sauvages. Mm. <laughs> when we were young, eh? We, when we go to school, even we would say, it's Sauvage. That's what my mother was called. Yeah, Sauvages. Yes, Sauvages. <laughs> And but then over the years, when I start to understand also more why we lived the way we lived, I said, there's nothing wrong to be called a savage. Because <laughs> 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 it, it's also how do we walk back in balance where this consumption is also ruining our futures or the children's futures. And I think that's what this whole uh, concept is about. And yeah, so next time we say, come on, Savage. So, 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 so,